Welcome to the Honolulu, Hawaii, a monthly property report. My name is Patrick O'Neill. I'm the principal broker at Luxury Homes International. And our very special guest today is the president of TZ Economics and one of Hawaii's leading economists, Mr. Paul Brewerbaker. Aloha Friday, Paul. How are you? How's it, Patrick? All right. Yes. All right. I want to tell you, we had a lot of uh, positive comments uh, when we did this last month and uh, really appreciate all the information that you share. Uh, yeah. Good fun for me. Yeah, uh, I really enjoy it. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, let's jump into it. So this week, the Honolulu Board of Realtors released the uh, property statistics for last month. Yep. And it looks like there's no signs of slowing down in the real estate market. A, a couple of data points here. Single family yep. homes and condos both set new price records. Yep. Uh, 41% of condos sold above the original asking price. 64% of homes sold above the original asking price. I don't remember even tracking these statistics before. I mean, maybe maybe they were, but- I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're out there. Um, but when things get really intense, some of these statistics just jump out uh, when you're looking at the data, yeah. Right, so now it's included in every press release coming out of the Board of Realtors. Fascinating, these numbers. And then, um, of course, the, you know, the big headline predicted by not only you, but also by Dr. Evil, uh, crossing over the $1 million <laughs> mark, right, for the median. Uh, mean, for <laughs> at least. Um, yeah. Yeah, like, so I, I, I know. All I had to I, do I, was. I, I know you've been talking about it, so I, I want to get your comment, but I want to show you something before we yeah. do that. Okay. This is a, a market infographic that we put out each month. Uh, for our clients and our agents. And everything is green. Everything's pointing up. This is very rare. I, I don't see this usually when mm. we do this, when the, when we do this uh, uh, report. So I want to ask you, that starting with the prices, on the long-term trend line, where are we yeah. and where do you see this thing heading? We're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help everybody visualize this by putting it all together in a moment. But we're, we're punching through the sort of medium-ish long-term trend on the single family side of things. So we've gotten to a million, we've reached a million a little ahead of schedule, right? We would have, you know, you get there eventually on the escalator of life. It's just, there's been this little acceleration in single family homes. On condos, we're getting back to the trend. We had drifted off the trend. We had drifted off the trend in both single family and condo prices pre-COVID. Right, 2019, so, it looked like things were starting to cool 2018, 19, they, exactly. They're a little, just a loss of energy. You know, the, the green arrows you have there in your spreadsheet mm -hmm. are, were like, you know, were associated with really small single digit kinds of numbers. And, you know, the number ought to be 4% or 5% appreciation. You know, and that's what it was for almost 10 years. Was all, well, it was during the 20 teens. And of yeah. course, it's more of a roller coaster than an escalator in the long run. But in the long run, you have to be on an escalator. You're never really sure which one it is. But I'm pretty sure, you know, in the environment we have with monetary policy and inflation expectations and so on and so forth, it's about a 4% escalator in terms of annual appreciation. And it's about a 2% per year appreciation escalator if you remove the inflation. So after inflation, you should get about 2% per year. And we have long-term data that, that suggests that that's true. So, so if you're- you say, that, if you're you four, say that one yeah. more time. So long-term- Yeah, long-term, the slope of the escalator going up is about 4%. Used to be five-ish. Now it's more like four-ish. Um, but if you remove the inflation, right? Half of the 4% is actually two percentage points of inflation. And that's just, all prices are rising that fast. So you take that away and what you have is a real return, a return in excess of inflation of about 2%, as opposed to say the value of this coffee mug, which is not going up 2% anymore. It's just there. Um, I mean, it works like a charm and it's, it, that's actually my wife that, <laughs> At the, the, the old Yankee Stadium, that's how faded this coffee mug is. At the on the hundredth anniversary, um, well, I know it's um, for I, Christmas. Yeah, I, yeah, 
Um, actually, no, that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that that 2% inflation rate um, come, it has been the same, even though inflation comes and goes, even though the cycles and bubbles and housing asset prices come and go, and sort of in the long run, you end up on that trend. And to your question, where are we relative to trend? We just kind of punched up through it. We drifted below it. We punched up through. We punched through much more decisively in the single family segment. Uh, while in the condo market, we're just kind of returning to it without having, uh, you know, really. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But that's yeah. kind of the tenor of the market. And so in talking about that, so there's certainly this bifurcation, the condo single family, you know, we've, we've seen that already, you know, there, we have the, there was, there was so think, condos yeah, are starting I, to come back. So yeah. year to date home prices are up over 20%. Single That's family home prices. Single family home prices. Yeah. That yeah. hasn't happened in a long time. I think it was 2005, 2006. What do you mean right. that? And, yeah. I mean, is that well, anything... I, I, I'd say two things. One is that I, I have a friend, actually, a colleague who his definition of a bubble is when home prices start rising at 20% per annum or 25%. I can't remember. <laughs> it's some number like 20 to 25%. And I say, well, that's, that's kind of arbitrary, right? Um, but it's a fact. If you go back and look at the subprime bubble in the early 2000s, which you just preferred and the Japan bubble in the late 1980s and early 1990s in both episodes for about a five-year interval on each occasion we observed 20 percent appreciation per year um, you know for four or five years now do the math with compounding 20 percent per year is 100 percent in four or five years because you're compounding and um, well and then home prices have doubled in four or five years the only problem is nothing else has doubled. <laughs> and that's the problem with bubbles is you get you get to the peak and everything you've left everything behind. And in particular, you've left people's ability to buy a house because their incomes haven't doubled. You mm -hmm. left that behind. And so you you know, we should be concerned if we're transitioning out of a period in which valuations were stagnant relative to trend. And then something disruptive, uh, COVID and its consequences occurred that shook up the housing market in a way people hadn't anticipated. And even in the moment, weren't really sure was, you know, there was a period for a couple months, April, May of last year, where it was like, wait, are we going down or are we going up? What's going on? And of course, we know subsequently things have broken to the upside. And, um, and, and now there's... A, a real challenge for for people, you know, people ought to think of housing as an investment, even if they're living in uh, their house. And uh, we're at a moment where you got to start to think about whether we're entering bubble territory or not. Like six months ago, we could joke about uh, GameStop stock or Bitcoin <laughs> or, you know, AMC theaters, these meme bubbles that were uh, coming and going every few months in in, uh, in an alternative investment markets, but housing that's a that's a kind of a core investment class for most households. Mm -hmm. uh, most households are invested in the stock market passively through their retirement funds, but their house that's an active. As I say, they either live in the house or the decision to buy or sell one is a, is a big one uh, uh, when they're not, uh, and of course it is when they are. So. We're just going to have to see. I, I've been thinking. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. I've been well, thinking. Let, let me we ask you one thing. So sh yeah. short term, short term, next six yeah. months, any obvious headwinds, anything? Or it just kind of seems like we're going to keep heading in this direction? Well, no, that's that's the other side of the, the coin. You, you, you'd like things to be predictable in the sense that, well, it's just momentum. And we're, we're on the escalator and we're in a little bubblicious you know, we're leaping a couple steps up the escalator, um, but that won't last forever. It's a, you know, people are talking about this in the commodity, you know, well, lumber prices, that's a, you know, transitory inflation shock, right? That's a supply chain problem. And you could make the same argument in housing. We have a supply chain problem. In fact, part of the supply chain problem was that the supply chain for building materials last year got all jammed up and it's taken a, like a whole year 
to start to resolve and, and settle down. Now that's lumber in particular. If you go look at lumber prices today, big yawn, nobody cares, but they tripled over a period of about six months uh, through mid July. And now they've collapsed to about a third of what they were at the peak in July. But those supply chain problems in building materials are one thing, a supply chain problem in the production of new homes or listing of existing homes, because that's another source of supply. When people cut back on listing homes because they're hiding out in their house from a pandemic, or when people cut back on building them or can't per get permission to build them, when suddenly a group of people show up that realize they can work remotely from Hawaii and need a house, that's a supply chain problem. That's, and of course, it's the same fundamental housing problem we've had in Hawaii for decades now, which is a supply problem. And you've said oh, this, a, you've said this multiple times. The only time I, we've had this few building I'm permits put it on is my World War II. Yeah, that's it's right. That's right. Ridiculous. Is that, is that true? Is that, are we still there at World War it's II worse. level building? It's worse. It's worse. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, what's the, the, the phrase I like to use is, uh, the only decade worse than the last decade was the 1940s, <laughs> and they had World War II. That was their excuse. We we built more houses in 1928 than we built on Oahu in 2020 with computers. So <laughs> I mean, it's a, I could go on, but uh, we built fascinating. I mean, it's, it's we built crazy. twice as many houses during the Great Depression as a proportion of the existing housing inventory. That is- We built in, twice as many houses during the Great Depression. A, a, as, as a proportion, proportion of the existing inventory. Right. right? In, in absolute right. number, we didn't build as many. Right. But relative to the existing housing stock- And our population's we building, been swelling. Well, the increasing. population was growing then, right? Because right. all the Filipinos are coming over from like, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. to work in the cane fields. I mean, there's very rapid population growth in the, in the early 20th century, which, uh, and, and of course, now we, we have population decline. So there's some, there's, you know, the, the outlook is a little more cloudy for, for home building and absorption. And it's partly because of that uncertainty about how the 2020s are gonna play out that um, has led um, builders to be conservative uh, and, um, you know, to be fair, maybe uh, planning officials that are keeping track of these things uh, to be uh, more, tempered in their uh, expectations for, you know, an organic growth of uh, uh, housing need and housing demand. But the fact is people have been leaving, people were leaving Hawaii on net for several years prior to COVID. And the, the risk now is that we, that, that will continue uh, be, because whatever COVID did to push certain parts of the economy in one direction, like anything involving remote, whatever, remote learning, e-commerce, you name it, um, has all benefited. It's been pushing in the other direction uh, for people, you know, working in say, service industries and face-to-face -face contact with customers. Wow, we just described tourism, the largest export. And so these cross currents are making it very complicated to sort out what's happening. My concern right now is that housing may be in the middle of a, a bubblicious moment that actually does pick up some momentum. I thought it was going to be more of a transitory passing phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. Okay. Well, I'll take a quick break. Um, when we come back, we're going to take a look at uh, closed sales and uh, the sales velocity. So don't That's go away. Good. We'll be right back. Okay, and we are back with uh, Paul Brubaker, uh, leading economist here in Hawaii. And Paul, let's take a look at closed sales volume and velocity. Mm. Um, we're looking at closed sales. So homes year to date are up 27%, condos up almost 70% in volume. Mm. Now, I, I think we know why, but how, so, how does this look? It tells you how far down it went. <laughs> how a year far ago. down it was, right? So, but <laughs> how are we on? closed volume again kind of looking at it more from the long-term trend line yeah i think really so i'm going to show you my version of the board's data because i do um i, I do seasonally adjust it uh, which helps 
for such an interpretation. So I've got a lot, of, a lot going on here, but everything you've talked about. Across the top of the slide here are listings on the left and sales on the right, closed sales on the right. And then across the bottom, I've got inventories on the left. And then the prices, we were just talking about the prices, talking about single family home prices, punching through the trend you see there, and condo prices working their way back to the trend. And the reason these two market segments performances have been so disparate, disparate, um, different, is because the condos right now, you can see in the sales volumes in the upper right, the condos, as you say, the sales volumes are up 70% from a deep trough. Condo sales rebounded um, with a little bit of a lag. You see how single family home sales kind of busted a move early? Now, now condos are all the rage right now, no doubt. Condos this summer is a grand slam for condos. So we're looking at you know, 600, 650 sales on a monthly basis, not quite 700 on a seasonally adjusted basis. So taking into account that it's summer and it's a more uh, you know, heavily um, trafficked market, so to speak. Um, but that's up from maybe 500 sales on a seasonally adjusted basis pre-COVID, when I say pre-COVID, well back in 2016, 2017, at the, at the height of the 20 teens cycle, such as it was. Now compare those sales volumes on the right with the listings on the left side of the page. And the scales here are exactly the same. So you can read horizontally across from left to right. Notice that single family homes, the, the heavier, darker series, single family home listings have averaged around 400, maybe 450. You see that, kind of that horizontal yeah. configuration pre-COVID and post. Now, a big drop after COVID as everything quieted down, but single family home listings have returned to about 400 new listings each month. But sales post COVID for single family homes jumped right up to that 400 unit territory. So in other words, single family homes are selling as fast as they're being listed. And many of them, as you say, in large numbers, um, large proportions for higher than listing price. It's a very tight market. That has now happened in condos just the last several months, just this summer. So you see condos now, condo sales in the upper right, now have risen roughly to equate with new condos list, new condo listings. There had been for several years, um, you know, more listings in the condo space than there was actual absorption in closed sales. And that's why the condo inventories were piling up in 2000, 2019 and much of 2020. Since about a year ago, but especially now this spring and summer, the summer the condo absorption has erupted. And so we're seeing both market segments get very tight. One month of inventory on the single family side, maybe two months of inventory well, on the condo that's, that's side. Let's let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, the months of remaining inventory. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, uh, it's a, kind of a factor of inventory in the sales pace. We look at how many homes are available. What's the selling pace? If no more inventory came on the market, how long would it take to sell those yeah. off? Traditionally, we kind of always talked about equilibrium between buyers and sellers market being somewhere around four and a half plus or minus somewhere in that area. Uh, if you're getting up into higher numbers, seven months, eight months, 10 months, clearly a buyer's market. Anything below that number, clearly a seller's market. We're at 1.2 for single family homes. I think 1.9 for condos. Clearly yeah. it's a seller's market right now in both segments. Any headwinds you see coming up in this or? Well, that's the, that, the point we were starting to talk about a second ago or a couple of minutes ago. We, you know, it's, it's, it's tempting to just look at what we were just looking at. I'll bring it back up and think, wow, momentum. And just project on out into the future like it's going to continue at the robust pace, both for sales and for prices, even in condos that we're seeing of late. Condos having lagged a little bit longer uh, than on the single family side. But there are headwinds you have to be concerned about, one of which is what we're going through right now with this 
with this uh, Delta variant a wave. And is that, do I have that slide in here? I, it's all in the wrong order because um, I, because I wasn't ready. <laughs> but here's, <laughs> okay. here's the, you can see the Delta yeah. wave through Labor Day nationwide. And here's ours here in Hawaii. So we had actually, in Hawaii, we had done really well at tamping down the, you know, there's roughly four waves here. The one in the spring of 2020, the one in the summer of 2020, the one in the fall and winter, peaking at the end of January. And then the one this summer, which I think caught a lot of people by surprise, caught me by surprise, yeah. because we had thought maybe vaccination, you know, would have a lot. And of course, because people were thinking along those lines, they went out and partied and spread around a new variant of the disease. The fact that that happened in Hawaii with an intensity, put it this way, you've heard about Arkansas, that's Hawaii. <laughs> Arkansas has, you know, whatever happened in Arkansas over the last month is right where Maui and Big Island and Oahu were last week. Now we might have peaked, I think we may have peaked over Labor Day weekend. You can see the numbers starting to drop because, you know, people have freaked out and they've changed their behavior. But this is exactly the kind of headwind you have to be concerned about because I thought we were done. And now what I'm thinking about this is, you know, wait for the mu waves. I mean, I the know. problem here is we are vaccinated, most of us, but all it takes is the few people who aren't to spread this, um, these variants, these mutations, and then another 100,000 people die. Dude, another 100,000 Americans are going to die, Crazy. will have died since, you know, 4th of July weekend when we thought we were done with it. Well, and Paul, let me, let me, I know you have some really cool stuff on the COVID data that, that I want, I want well, to get into in a sure. moment, if that's okay, yeah. if, if you're okay with that. But let, let me just ask you, before we it. leave this, before we leave this subject, um, for the buyer who's thinking, yeah. Should I go buy something right now? Yeah, so yeah. Say, Wait, I mean, I know, I hate to ask you this, but do you have any advice? Well, I, I would say weigh all of the factors. And, you know, a rough listing of them is that it turns out at a million dollars, we're not that far from the historic trend. Um, if if I, I dare go back to that just for a second, sorry, but you have to see it to understand the trend here in home prices. Uh, you know, we're not really that far away, if we would have gotten to 1 million in another year or two anyway. The, the problem is that having gotten ahead of that trend uh, down here in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, uh, having punched through, we're now in, we're, we're, we're in bubbles just territory where you have to be concerned that if it continued to go 20% per year, all of the affordability, all affordability math would erode and you know, we'd be in another one of these bubbles where it's a, it's like a Ponzi scheme, right? It's fine until the last person, you do it, like if you're the last person into the Ponzi scheme, you're done. Um, actually, that's not really a, a, a good analogy, right? It's a, every buyer, right? Every previous seller made money. And you get to a point where Every buyer is thinking, I'm going to make money because I'm going to be able to sell it to the next guy until there isn't a next guy. Now, we're not there yet, but we're, we may be at the beginning of one of those moments. And so you have to weigh that. Yeah, just like, you know, how much mm -hmm. risk, how much risk can I tolerate in the long term view of things? How important is it for me to live in this house, in this place, in this configuration, this size or this, you know? Uh, and uh, so don't ever lose sight of the long-term motivation, even if as an investor and not an owner-occupant, uh, you're approaching the decision, think about it in the longer-term context against the performance of other asset classes, right? Because maybe, mm -hmm. you know, think about your whole portfolio. Um, I don't expect the interest rate environment to change significantly. I do think we're going to have more sort of these biological uh, variant driven cycles where people go out and party and then they pull back because a bunch of people died. And then, right, we're in this 
groundhog day kind of it's, well, it's not the business cycle it's not the investment cycle right. it's this stop start because of covid right um, we're all we're living through it right now let's take a uh, a real quick break when we come back, um, let's take a look at some of that, uh, the interesting COVID data that you have. You're willing to share that. You bet. I'll go find okay. it here. Okay. Well, Stand by. I'll be right back. All right. And we're back with uh, Paul Brubaker, uh, the Honolulu, Hawaii property report. Um, Paul, this past weekend, I was struck. I was watching college football is back, and I'm watching my mm. alma mater, Florida State University, playing Notre Dame. Who mm. knows? Um, mm. And uh, the stands, there's 79,000 people in the stands in Florida. There's no mask. All the players on the field, there's no, pro- there's no protocol at all. Nothing. Yeah. Okay, this is, this yeah. is on Saturday. Saturday evening, I'm talking to my brother-in-law, who is in Taipei, the whole country oh, yeah. is locked down still until they yeah. get down to single digits. And yeah. He can't go anywhere without a mask. You know, the restaurants yeah. haven't reopened fully, et cetera, et cetera. Hawaii, we're somewhere in limbo in between these two worlds. We're kind of half open, yeah. kind of half yeah. shut down. Can you kind of share like these, the waves from the past or the data you have from 1918 and what parallels are happening in today's COVID? Well, first of all, the phenomenon to which you refer of, of, you know, these multiple waves and the willingness or unwillingness of jurisdictions to engage in what are they're literally called non-pharmaceutical interventions, right? So you basically have two options. You can, if you have a vaccine, you can get everybody vaccinated. But um, if you don't, or you have a large enough proportion of the population that won't, uh, then you have to use other measures, these non-pharmaceutical measures, which include wearing masks, social distancing, per, you know, shutting down portions of economic activity from time to time. And we have this experience from 1918 and 1919. These are data from the fall of 1918 and the winter of 1919, where um, measured, and these are, they didn't, they didn't have the technology, right, to count every case the way we do it, it was, supercomputers, but they, you can go back and look at the public health records and enumerate the number of deaths in excess of what would have been the norm in a particular week of that year, right? So you can look at the past data and subsequent data, and then how many people died in the third week of September, 1918, compared to the average for the pre and post uh, pandemic uh, uh, interval. And, uh, and here's what you see, a very similar pattern to the one we've seen here, which may be the previous slide, if I, can I move around here? No, of course I have this all backwards, right? This is, you know, we've had multiple waves this time, we're in the fourth one now, but around um, the um, 1918, uh, 1919 window we're looking at here, experience varied tremendously depending on whether they're non farm non-pharmaceutical interventions were, um, you know, applied early versus later or were very rigorously uh, adhered to or, or, you know, when people slacked off. So the story in St. Louis, for example, is they had a lot of success on the right side of the screen here. They had a lot of success initially, uh, but then when they temporarily relaxed relaxed restrictions uh, later in the fall, um, they had a huge, uh, a second wave that was worse than the first. We're just we're repeating, the other way we're repeating what happened in, in 1918. Exactly. Blue. And literally to the, I mean, there are data, uh, th- this is from a paper, you see the reference there, by the way, mm-hmm. I could send you the slide and then you can share it if anybody's interested. You can find this, this is a print paper in 2007, by the way. So not only have we known it <laughs> for a hundred years, but <laughs> it's been out there in the, literature for the last uh, 10 or 15 uh, pre-COVID. But I know I was interested in the story from Denver because they know that the, f- the, the first confirmed case was a female student at the University of Denver who arrived for the fall semester in September, presented with these influenza assistance, uh, symptoms. And then from that uh, came their fall wave of uh, infectious uh, infection and 
excess mortality, right? So morbidity and mortality. And then things calmed down. Business at the Chamber of Commerce complained mm -hmm. about the lockdown of business. And so to sell, my, does that sound familiar? Yeah. And so to celebrate the uh, armistice on November 11th, 1918, right? They signed a, a ceasefire, the armistice, which we now celebrate as, as a, a v -Day. Veterans Day on November 11th every year. Um, they had a huge block party in Denver. <laughs> Not unlike the football game you just described. Right. And then they, they had, and it turned out to be a super spreader event and they had a, uh, an intense second wave. I, I feel for you. I, I was alerted. Somebody sent me a picture of Camp Randall, where I used to live in Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to school. Or the, the can I say, this is G rated anyway. Fuck them, Bucky. That's, you know, Bucky <laughs> I love it. that's the unofficial <laughs> slogan of the University of Wisconsin. And just uh, like you were describing, this is a, 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 a city with, you know, 150, 200,000 people when I lived there. So the population of the Big Island, which fills an 80,000 seat stadium every Saturday. And sure enough, there they were, packed to the gills, no mask, screaming their bloody heads off. Crazy, it's crazy, and, 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 our, and our, it's, it's just insane. It's insane, and then, but it's not like the whole world ended, and they're going to play again this weekend. So, I mean, well, it will end. I mean, do the math. That's eighty deaths. If they all get sick, eighty mm -hmm. one, eighty of them will die. I see. So, I think. Or is it 800? I mean, it's this is serious. Right. <laughs> serious, you know what? And, and not, I remember, and I remember you doing a presentation on this back in the beginning of COVID when it when it's first first hitting, and yeah. th there were anti masks, anti mask protesters, just right. like we have anti vax yeah. protesters now, yeah, yeah. right? Well, dude, I just heard this new one. So people are about right. Wearing a mask is an emphasis being uh, uh, mandated uh, that a mask shall be worn is an imposition on your personal freedom and being mandated that. So the new one's going to be uh, when children have to be vaccinated against COVID. That hasn't actually happened yet, right? Because the FDA hasn't provided uh, approval, right? The, the research is still being done as to whether the vaccine is safe for children under the age of 12. And uh, I, I, presumably it's forthcoming because here's the fact, Jack, they all be vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, pertussis, tetanus, hepatitis A, hepatitis B. I mean, good grief. They're already vaccinated for all this other stuff to go to school. Why is this any different? But, oh, trust me, bro. You thought the mass protests and the anti-vax uh, opposition was intense. Wait till somebody says, okay, now all the kids have to be vaccinated. Right. As right. if they already aren't. Right. Oh, geez. So that, well, that, that's the kind of, this is the headwind we're talking about. You think it's going to be fine, and then some craziness goes on. And nowadays, the, the like lunacy element is way higher. In the past, it used to be actual things that mattered, but now it's just whatever is going around on social media. Crazy. Well, Paul, uh, it's always such a, a real pleasure spending the time with you and uh, really look forward to doing this again uh, next month. Um, for everyone else out there, if you've enjoyed this, uh, consider giving us a thumbs up down below. Uh, that's it for today. So stay safe, get vaxxed, and aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. <laughs>